Journey of the Sparrows, Chapter 6. The next day, I again went to work with Alicia. I circled around the man with the white hair as I entered the factory room, and I didn't look up as I worked. The other women stared down also, and there were no sounds except for the buzzing of the sewing machines and an occasional siren outside. We all worked on the same dark green cloth, and I had to squint to see the seams. I glanced at Isabel once. During the morning and early afternoon, the man with the white hair didn't come near me. Then, through the sides of my eyes, I saw him cross the room and move behind me. Get up and come with me, he said. I panicked, and I looked at Alicia. Her face was white, and she started to get up. Now, he ordered. I pushed my chair back, my heart pounding, and followed him into a little hall behind the main room out of sight of the other woman. The man laughed and grabbed me by my shoulders, and as I twisted to get away from him, he snarled. You're illegal. I can do anything, he laughed again, and I smelled the guardias and saw the blood as he reached for my breast. I screamed, stop, don't, and swung out hard with my fist, smashing him in the nose. He slapped me across my face, but I twisted away and kicked him in the leg and screamed, Stay away! I ran through the other room. Alicia threw my coat at me, and I saw Isabel and the other woman cluster by the door to the back hall, making it hard for the man to follow me. I slammed out the slow sewing room door, practically fell down the steps, and ran out of the building into the cold. Finally, I stood, shivering and shaking, waiting for the L. We had almost no food, I thought, little money, and now I didn't have work and wouldn't be paid. Oscar was lying on our mattress when I got back to our room, and he looked up at me without much interest. Julia was away, washing dishes. Only the harmonica man was home, and he played sad, faraway music. Outside the window, the sun was low in the sky, and its reflection glowed on a few high windows. The rest of the buildings were in shadows. I sat down, my back against the wall, and I rested. Someone knocked on our apartment door, and the harmonica man quit playing and went to it. I heard low voices in Spanish. Then Tomas stepped into our doorway. I came to see if you or Julio were here, he said. They've begun feeding people at one of the churches, the one where Marta got your clothes. They don't check to see if you're legal or ask any questions. You just get in line, and they give you something to eat inside. I thought maybe you didn't have food. Feeling tears in my eyes, I looked directly at him and didn't turn away. Yes, we're hungry. I swallowed and nodded. Are you sure it's safe? Yes, I went last night. They didn't ask any questions, and there were other families, some like us. Bring Oscar, and I'll take you there. I stood Oscar up and put his coat on him. He seemed so thin and tired. Tomas asked, is there something else for him to wear? It might be a long wait outside. I glanced around. I don't know what. Tomas looked up at our curtains. Let's take one of those. We can wrap it around him. I got a chair and unpinned the curtain, heavy white material decorated with faded red roses. As Tomas led us down several blocks to the church, I noticed he was no longer limping. His foot must have been better. It was dusk when we arrived, and a line was waiting outside for the church to open. We went to the end of the line and wrapped Oscar in the curtain. He looked so small and strange. Tomas twisted the button of his coat between two fingers. What happened with your job? He asked me, tipping his head slightly. Why were you home when Alicia wasn't? I stared down. The boss didn't want me there any longer, I whispered. I'm sorry, Tomas said, and he blew on his hands to warm them. I thought of Tomas's eyes. When I looked directly at them, they looked deep like I imagined the ocean. The little girl in front of me cried, and her mother picked her up and tried to soothe her in Spanish. A pregnant blonde woman joined the line behind us. Her nose was red, and she didn't seem to have any eyelashes. Then, an old woman hobbled over to us, pushing a tattered baby buggy stuffed with newspapers, plastic flowers, and empty cans. She walked stiffly with short, quick steps, staring straight ahead and wearing a ragged red coat that was wrapped in a golden green shawl, the color of the Quetzal's wings. 
She stopped in front of us, suddenly seemed to spot Oscar, and then let go of her buggy. Her face was dark and wrinkled, and the upper lids of her large, weary eyes seemed thick with age. Now, ain't you a queer one, she said in Spanish, peering into Oscar's eyes. Oscar blinked and stared directly back at her from the folds of the old curtain. I stepped over to push her away from Oscar, and she turned to me, smiling. Her chin jutted out, and her black hair was twisted into a rubber band and stuck straight out on one side of her head. Her eyes seemed strange, but kind. You're in charge of him, are you, dearie? Well, the boy looks like my baby brother, only one I've ever loved, sweet as sugar cane. Tomas stepped behind Oscar, his hands on Oscar's shoulders. The old woman continued to talk in my direction. When you see me, you see my daddy. Look like him and she got his and got his ways too. Cussedness. Her eyes squinted, and she jabbed a long gnarled finger at the air. I just the very devil, me. Then her eyes turned soft, and she reached out to pat Oscar. But not my baby brother. Oscar's face grew sober. Have you seen the shadow man? he asked clearly. Many a time, many a time, she said, and she crossed herself, pulled a cross with Jesus on it from her pocket, and held it in front of Oscar. Take this, mijito, she said. It'll keep you safe. Oscar reached up from the folds of the curtain and clutched the cross. His eyes glowed. When the weather's better, you can visit me, she said. I'll teach you to feed pigeons. She bent down and whispered close to his ear. See, if you're very clever, sometimes you can steal a little bread. She nodded toward the church and smiled. Oscar giggled. Well, well, the boy's better off, the old woman sighed. She stood back up and slapped her hand several times against her side. Even in the near dark, I thought I saw dust rise from her coat. We must be about our work, mustn't we? She spoke to the empty air behind her shoulder. Doggone right, she said, as if in response. Take care of your own and God'll take care of the others. She gave a courtly bow at the air, then turned to me and winked. I got funny ways, she said as she left, pushing her buggy to the end of the line. I looked at Tomas, trying not to laugh. Where did she come from, I asked. Damned if I know, Tomas laughed as he arched his eyebrows, shrugged his shoulders, and gestured upward with his hands. Oscar tugged on my sleeve. Her shawl, it's the color of the Quetzal bird in the cage, he said. I nodded, staring after her and remembering how I'd freed the bird. That's right, you talked about it in the crate. I remember, Tomas responded. You said you saw a Quetzal. Was this, it was still alive? I thought they'd die in a cage. We found it in time, I answered. Papa told us stories about them. <sighs> Lost my spot. He said Quetzals are shy and like to live in forests, not around people. I pictured the thrashing bird as I worked to open the cage. Its brown black eyes had seemed to beg for freedom. I heard the Indians thought Quetzals stood for beauty and goodness, Tomas said, and again I nodded. Magic, don't forget the magic, Oscar added. Suddenly the church door opened and people pressed forward. I grabbed Oscar's hand as we moved quickly to the door. Oscar, Tomas, and I filled our empty stomachs with hot stew, canned fruit, and bread. Oscar fell asleep smiling that night, and I promised I'd be with him the next day. As he slept, I wrote a letter saying goodbye to Isabel to send with Alicia to work in the morning. As Julia and I lay on our mattress, I whispered, Do you think it was all right for me to take Oscar to the church with Tomas? Julia reached over and touched my hair. Yes, little sister. I think Papa would approve. And Mama. I smiled, thought of Isabel, and fell asleep. I found no work during the following days, so Oscar and I stayed indoors watching television most of the time. We laughed at the game shows, and I tried to learn the sounds of English. I told Oscar stories to keep him talking, and wished we were at home so I could draw my pictures in the dirt. Oscar often watched the men playing cards, and when the man with the tattoo won, he would laugh, pull Oscar against him, and tossle Oscar's hair. Oscar would be a little shy, but he'd giggle. 
Our bathroom had a mirror, and in the late afternoons, before going to the church with Tomas, I'd comb my hair in different ways, trying to look older. Sometimes I pulled my dark hair over one shoulder, sometimes I wore one braid down my back, but most of the time I wore it combed straight back with a ribbon I'd cut from the curtain. A few times I'd just watched myself in the mirror and sang Julia's songs. Often I'd stare at my eyes. I was beginning to look directly at Tomas when we'd talk at the church. I was embarrassed that I'd do that. I didn't think Papa'd have liked it, and I prayed to Our Lady that she'd keep me polite. Then Tomas and I would practice our English, and before long, I'd look at him again. One evening, as we were waiting with Oscar for the church to open so we could eat, I said, Tomas, that first day after the crates in Marta's apartment, you said something about the ocean, that you liked to swim far out in it. Tomas smiled. Yes, especially during storms. That's when the waves are huge. Although Mama or Marta never knew about that part of it. They'd have killed me if they'd known, he laughed. Why'd you like to do it? Didn't, feel, didn't it feel dangerous? Nope, I never felt scared in the water. I just felt like I was all alone. Nobody wanted anything. Just me and the waves and all that excitement. He ran his fingers through his hair. See, I never knew my dad. And my mom, she was always working. But she had big plans for me. Big. So I started swimming out alone when I was really little. When I was out there, I didn't care about anything. I just loved the waves. His eyes smiled. I watched the other people in the line for a few minutes. When I glanced back, Tomas was twisting his hair with one finger, staring far away. I never saw the ocean, I said, but Papa told us stories about it, about how he went out on fishing boats once a year. Sometimes I'd pretend clouds were waves. Papa said you could dive right into waves and they'd go over the top of you. I giggled. Once I jumped off our shed, pretending I was diving in the waves. Mama was really mad at me. Tomas laughed at me and I picked Oscar up. When I was little, he said, kids used to tease me because my eyes were blue. Then Mama would sing songs to me and tell me I had the ocean in my eyes. Guess that's why I wasn't scared during storms. I lay on our mattress that night and thought of Tomas swimming in the ocean. The next afternoon, the harmonica man brought home a stack of cream-colored paper, words in English, and a drawing of a raised fist were printed on one side, but the other side was blank. I began drawing on the paper with our pencil, and when the harmonica man saw my excitement, he gave me money for crayons and a few felt-tip pens like we had seen in the toy store. I spent the next days on my hands and knees on the floor drawing pictures of home for Oscar. I drew him a blue sky with a rainbow of all the colors rising above bright green sugarcane fields. I drew him the head of a green and white rooster, its shiny black eyes staring at us and its red comb crowning its head, while our dirt brown dog stood in the background. I drew him a bell tower in a white church against a blue sky with a bird flying toward it. I drew him a violet and pink lilies and a pale yellow and orange butterfly rising into the air. I drew him the magnificent Quetzal from Papa's stories with its intelligent eyes, its golden green wings and colored plumes and its red and white body as it soared up into the sky away from the cage. But I drew no people for Oscar, even when he pleaded with me, please Maria, draw mama, draw mama. I'd shake my head and say, no Oscar, I can't draw mama, not mama or papa. When Alicia saw all of our pictures from home, she brought us a roll of tape, and we taped them on the walls of the rooms, and especially above the mattresses. The men smiled at night over our newest work, and Oscar's eyes warmed with the pictures. Still, even with the food from the church, he grew thinner. One afternoon, while fresh air blew in from our open window, and I heard birds, Oscar slept on our mattress with his arm thrown over his face. I sat there watching his fragile breathing, and felt dear and felt fear deep within my stomach. I'd watched other little brothers get thinner, then get sick and die, three of them as babies, and I'd never loved them as much as I loved Oscar. I touched Oscar's pale cheek, but he didn't wake, just kept breathing shallowly. I trembled, not knowing what to do, then knelt on the floor next to him and drew him another picture. I sketched a little brown boy standing beneath a green amate tree, a tiny bird on his shoulder, 
as he tossed pebbles into the air. I placed a house of sticks to his left, using a pencil and brown crayon, I outlined the virgin in the air above the tree looking down on the boy, and colored the virgin's clothes with blue, yellow, and white. When Oscar woke, I gave it to him, and he looked up solemnly at me with tears in his eyes. Maria, please, he begged again. Draw in, Mama. Draw in, Mama. I stared at him, swallowed, and nodded. I picked up the pencil and drew the form of a woman. She was stiff and lifeless, but Mama. Beside her, I drew baby Teresa. Oscar reached for the drawing and knelt on the floor, folding the picture in half and pressing it carefully with his hands. He folded it again and again into a little square and held it against his chest. I felt tears on my cheeks from missing Mama. From that time on, Oscar carried the drawing with him wherever he went, opening it up every so often, staring at it carefully and folding it back up. A few afternoons later, I decided Oscar needed some sun, so I led him back behind our building where there weren't other people. The snow had melted, the weather was warmer, and birds were singing. I looked until I found several little stones to give Oscar, and we bent down with our backs against the wall. Pigeons flew from the roofs of nearby buildings and landed near us. Then I saw a red and white kite with a long yellow tail flying high above the roof of a nearby building. Oscar, look! I jumped up and shouted. The kite swept through the air and rode a breeze like a bird, then caught a downward draft and plunged behind another building. As we stared at where the kite had disappeared, the old woman in the golden green shawl pushed her baby buggy around the corner of the building. She jumped at seeing us. Well, well, she said. It's my little pet. She shuffled over to Oscar, put her hand on his head. Oscar pointed up where the kite had been. Oh, you saw the kite, did you? That means it's spring, she chuckled. Spring, she said in English, then in Spanish. Even the humble sparrow has its season. She turned to me. Bring the boy and come with me, dearie. I'll show you the other sign of spring. She paused. Those others wouldn't show it to them. No way. They don't know nothing, she said with scorn. We followed her back through an alley and behind another cluttered building where the old woman mat marched forward, breaking her way through the trash the way men at home would chop through the brush with machetes. She looked at me over her shoulder, house full of good kids, eyes the bad one, just be my baby brother that got along with me. To the others I say, you done with me, then I done with you. I don't go in with a lot of folks. She stopped suddenly straightened her shoulders, smiled, and pointed to the ground. Tiny bright yellow and purple flowers were blooming among the dead weeds. I knelt down and stared at them. Oh, Oscar, see, like home. He peered at the blossoms, and his eyes were warm. I looked up at the funny, frail old woman. My baby brother, she said. He thought flowers came from ribbons in the ground. That night, as we waited in line with Tomas at the church, the old woman came around the corner, pushing her buggy. Look, Oscar said as he smiled, la señora Quetzal, the Quetzal lady. The woman's lower lip jutted out into a great toothless smile. She pushed her buggy up next to us, bowed in front of me, then swept her hand through the air into the buggy, grabbed a bundle, and thrust it at me. Dearie, she said, I brought you and the boy a kite. I reached for it, delighted, and turned to Tomas. She said a kite was the sign of spring. He placed his hand on my shoulder. When I'm not working, we'll take Oscar to an empty lot and fly it. The warmth from his hand spread through my back. I smiled at the old woman. Gracias, muchas gracias. A few days later, when the sun was shining and wind blowing, Tomas showed up at our door. It's a good day for flying the kite, he said. I frowned. I don't know, Oscar has a little fever. Tomas went to Oscar and bent down to where he lay on the mattress. Tomas smiled and said, Well, Oscar, you up to watching the kite? Oscar seemed excited. I placed my hand on his forehead. It was warmer than usual, but not hot. Tomas looked up at me. We'll wrap him in the curtain, and he can stay quiet. Aren't you afraid outside during the day because of the police? No, Tomas shook his head. We look just like the others. No one pays attention. So we wrapped Oscar in the curtain, went to an empty lot, and set him on some bricks. 
Then we put the yellow and green kite together and attached string. The warm wind blew through my coat, against my chest, and up my arm, as I held the kite in the air, stretching as high as I could. Tomas ran away from me, pulling the string. The kite flew into the air, suddenly turned upside down, and plunged to the ground again. I think it's going to work. Tomas shouted at me as he ran to the kite. He handed it to me and tried again. This time, the kite swooped higher into the air. Tomas ran further, and it jerked up and caught the wind and soared. I stood staring at the sky. Somehow, the kite avoided the buildings and the lines. Other children joined us, shouting and laughing. Pigeons flew up toward the kite, the color of their wings reversing in the air as they swerved on the wind. Your turn, Thomas shouted to me. I hurried over next to him, grabbed the string, and ran with it myself, tripping through the rubbish but with my spirit soaring. The kite caught a downdraft and swooped toward the ground, but I grabbed the loose string, pulled hard, and ran again, and it lifted. I heard Oscar squealing and clapping his hands. Tomas ran up next to me and placed his hands over mine. Let Oscar hold it, he said, before it hits a building. We circled to Oscar, tugging at the kite to keep it in the air, but it swooped downward and hit the ground. Tomas ran to the kite again, held it in the air, and yelled, Pull! Pull! I tugged hard on the string and ran. The kite went back into the air. I laughed with joy and excitement as I reached Oscar, who stood on his tiptoes, squealing. Take it, Oscar, I shouted, and pull tight. He clutched the string in his small hands and stumbled backward, the curtain falling from his shoulders. Yeah, yeah, he shouted and laughed so hard he tumbled over. I grabbed the string and pulled, bent over with laughter until I fell on the ground with him. Tom Tomas joined us and yanked the string, but the kite swept up sideways and fell. Out of breath and also laughing, Tomas flung himself on the ground next to us. That night, Oscar glowed with excitement, and I st sat up late working on a drawing of Our Lady I was making for Marta and Tomas. I'd sketched the form on a piece of wood I'd found. While the others slept, I filled in the Virgin's figure with deep colors of red, blue, and yellow until the colors sang with the voices of our villagers at, masa. Oh, at Mass. Gracias, I whispered to her, smiling, before I fell asleep. The next morning, in the dim light of dawn, Alicia shook me. The man with the white hair is gone, she whispered. I think it's safe for you to come back to work. Julia was awake, sipping coffee and sitting on the mattress with her back against the wall. I think you'd better go with her, Maria, Julia said, even though it means leaving Oscar alone. I don't know how much longer I can wash dishes. Her voice sounded like a sob. I'll go to Marta's before I start work to tell Tomas. God willing, he'll still take Oscar to eat without you. Will you tell Oscar goodbye for me? She nodded. My cheeks flushed, and will you give my picture of Our Lady to Marta and Tomas? Julia smiled at me. Yes, little sister, of course. A short time later, I rode with Alicia on the L. It was lighter now than when I'd gone with her before. The air was clear, and the sun was already warm. A good day for a kite, I thought, and smiled when I remembered the day before. Still, I wondered if I shouldn't have taken Oscar outside with his fever. I also wondered how much Tomas noted the darkness of my skin. Then I pictured the old woman in the golden green shawl, the Kitsal lady, and I smiled again and felt tears in my eyes. <laughs>